continuing our series on living in the goodness of God, living in the goodness of God. And if there ever was a time that we should be focusing on goodness, it is right now. As I mentioned last Sunday, I'm getting very tired of all the negativity that the world is bombarding us with. Folks, I want to tell you something. You can be mired in all the negativity all you want. It will drag you to the bottom. That's not what God's plan is this morning. Uh, and so last Sunday, uh, our message, uh, well, actually today my message is entitled, Letting God Meet My Needs. This is part of our, our uh, living in the goodness of God, letting God meet my needs. Now, last week, as a quick recap, my message was entitled, Is God Really Good All the Time? And overwhelmingly, if we read the Bible, we can affirm that we have a good father. As a matter of fact, Psalm 100 verse 5 says, The Lord is always good in the Living Bible. He is always good. He is always loving and kind, not only in the good times, in every situation. And His faithfulness goes on and on to each succeeding generation. Aren't you glad today that we don't have to worry about our children there are times we go, you know what, I'm so worried about what's going to happen in the future to my children. You know what? God's goodness, at the same as it was to you, will be to your succeeding generation as well. Amen. When you forget how good God really is, it can have some very detrimental effects to your relationship with Him. The first, and let's quickly recap here, the first negative consequence about for, of forgetting uh, of God's goodness is I start claiming credit for the things that God did for me. I said last Sunday, the problem with a self-made man or woman is that they worship their creator. They worship themselves. And this morning, actually, uh, Romans 1 verse 21 speaks of it. It says, they know that God exists, but they don't give him credit for all that he has made, and they are ungrateful. That is the world that we live in. And when you forget the goodness of God, you fall in the same category. You start claiming credit for things that God has done for you. The second thing you do is you stop asking God for help. When you forget how eager God is to help you, how much he wants to help you, you start depending on yourself and you stop going to God in prayer. The third thing, the third negative thing when you forget God's goodness is you stop trusting God in difficult circumstances. When you depend on yourself all the time, when difficult circumstances come along, guess what? You don't depend on God anymore. You depend on yourself. The fourth thing that happens is you become pessimistic about the future. How many of you know people who live in, with, with a life of pessimism because they're always worried about the future. You lose hope because you are not dependent on the goodness of God. Folks, if God is not good, you and I are all up the creek without a paddle. I'll tell you that right now. The psalmist said this, he said, I would have despaired, I would have been desperate unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of God in the land of the living. But folks, we're not people who despair, because you know what? We will see today and tomorrow the goodness of God in our lives. Now, before we, we talk about our, our, our passage this morning, learning to uh, accept the blessings of God and not worry in our lives, I want to give you three quick fundamental truths, and you can just write each one of them down. Number one, God is the source of everything that you need to live. You don't have to look to Wall Street. You don't have to look to your retirement fund, thank God, for me, because there's not a whole lot of a one there. As a matter of, <laughs> matter of fact, I, I had my car, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, begging for, for your compassion or anything. I have an old Cavalier, and I took it to the mechanic this week. For some work. And I have my clergy card hanging from the window of my old cavalier. <laughs> and he said to me, he said, and, and he, he, he said, you know what, I don't go to church, but if I did go to church, you'd be my pastor. That's what he says. So he looks at my car and he looks at the clergy card and he says, you know what, at least when you pull up to church on a Sunday morning, they know that you're not there for the money. 
But you know what? We don't need to look to these outside sources for our security. You know what? You can lose all of these things. We can lose our health. We can lose our job. We can lose our good looks. Some of you already have lost your good looks. All right? Uh, you know what? We can lose our lives. We can lose our minds. But folks, this morning, we need to put our security in something that cannot be taken from us, and that is our relationship with the good God. Amen. Psalm 23, verse 1, and I want you to say it with me together this morning. The Lord is my shepherd. I will lack nothing. Now, my kids memorized, and we all memorized the Old Testament, or I mean the, the New King James or the Old King James Version, I shall not want. It means the same thing. I will lack nothing. And that's our theme verse out of Psalm 23 for this morning. That's the place where he says, I will be your security in every situation. Now the question, folks, is I want to ask you, does, does anybody know what a shepherd is this morning? Most of you didn't grow up on a sheep farm. Um, but, you know, shepherds are people who care for the sheep. Why do sheep need to be cared for so much? You don't hear about cowperds. You don't hear about people that go and spend time with the cows or the horses. But sheep need care. When it talks about the fact that, gee, that, that, that the Lord is our shepherd, it means we need shepherding. Folks, I want you to know this morning that, she that sheep are very defenseless animals. They have a lot of natural predators. They're not very fast. They can't run very well. They don't have claws. They don't have big teeth that, that, that where they can defend themselves. And on top of that, they're not very smart. When the Bible talks about the fact that we are God's sheep, it's not necessarily being complimentary, okay? It means that you need help, all right? They fall off cliffs. They get lost. Uh, you know what? Without a shepherd, they'll, they'll, they probably would get eaten. Now, what does a shepherd do? And you may want to write this down. A shepherd feeds and leads and meets needs. A shepherd feeds and leads and meets needs. That's what a shepherd does. Now, our needs are various, folks. Sometimes we need protection. Sometimes we need comfort. We need encouragement. We need discipline. We need direction. And we're going to look at all these different things as we, in this series, look and work through Psalm 23. But today, the Lord is my shepherd, I will not want. He will meet my needs. By the way, do you know what the Greek word for shepherd is? Mina, do you, do you know, uh, it, it's, it, it's, now of course, it, the word that we use is taken from this Greek word. It's the word pastor, Okay. A pastor is a shepherd. That's what I am. All right? I, I'm, I, that's my lowly role, folks. I'm here to feed you and to lead you. Amen? And to meet your needs. As a matter of fact, if you're a mother, if you're a dad of little children, you're shepherds. You lead them and you meet their needs. That's what shepherds do. If you happen to be in business today and... Um, you're supervising a group of people as a manager. I want you to know that, that shepherding capabilities and responsibilities are, are required. You don't, that people don't serve you, you serve them. All right? Uh, the second thing is that there is nothing I need that God can't supply. Okay? There is nothing I need that God cannot supply. Philippians chapter 4 verse 19 says, God will supply all of my needs according to his rich resources in Christ Jesus. You may want to circle the word in Christ Jesus. How many of you know that God doesn't meet your needs because you're good? God meets your needs because he is good. It's in Christ Jesus. It's because of what Jesus has done for you that you have access to all of God's blessings today not because of what you have done. The third principle that I just want to affirm before we move on is that God does not want you worrying about anything. Nothing. Nada. Zero. As a matter of fact, worrying is probably the number one sin on the planet. Did you know that? God says you don't need to worry. I don't want you worrying. 
Philippians 4, 6. I think we should have it on the screen. Don't worry about anything. I looked at some of the interpretations for the Greek, and that means anything means anything. Like, don't worry about anything. You can pray or you can panic. Those are the choices. You can have fear or you can have faith. If you're not praying, you're panicking. There, here's another uh, relative description. You can worry or you can worship. If you are worrying, then worship goes out the back door. But if you are worshiping, then worry goes out the back door. Amen? God says, I don't want you worrying about anything. Now, why does God say that? Jesus described it to us on the Sermon on the Mount. And where I'm going to give you five reasons why you should not worry. Here's number one. Worry is unreasonable. In other words, it does not make sense. Worrying is illogical. The Bible says in Matthew 6, 25, and we should have it up there, do not worry about your life, what you should eat or what you should drink. And don't worry about your body and what you will wear. This morning, I got up and I was trying to figure out, I, I couldn't find a shirt where the neck was big enough. Pastor Ted, have you had that problem with the tie? And, and you, no, you never had that problem. And, 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 I, and I couldn't get the top button done up on all the shirts. And I'm looking through all these shirts. The Lord, you know what? Maybe I should just come just relax. That's what the Lord says. Don't worry about what you should wear. You know what? We've talked about this many times today. It's unreasonable. Did you know that clothes don't make a man or a woman? I want you to know that. Now, Brother Dolu, I'm not sure if Brother Dolu believes that. Because Brother Dolu is always dressed to the nines. I want you to know that. Brother Dolu, you look good all the time. But you know what? If you came in here with shorts on and a t-shirt, I'd love you anyway. You know what? And God loves you anyway. Amen. That's right. You know, that some, for some people, that's a big, uh, you know, revelation. You know, and, and part of the problem that worry is unreasonable, or the reason that worry is unreasonable, is that we worry about the wrong things. We worry about the little stuff. Stuff that folks is, you know, it's something small tomorrow, the doctor's appointment. You know, what's the doctor going to say? And, and, and we worry, and we worry. My dad has a saying. He said, he says, whenever something goes wrong, he says, oh, in a hundred years from now, it won't matter. And, and I've heard my dad say that multiple times. In a hundred years from now, it won't matter, Steve. Don't worry about it. And I guess maybe when you're 90 years old, like he is, or almost, you can say that kind of thing, right? You have some experience in the matter. But we pick all the wrong things to be worried about. The, the second reason that worrying is useless is that you can't change what you're worrying about. To worry about something that you can't change doesn't make any sense. And to worry about stuff that you can change doesn't make sense either. You can either change the circumstance or you can't. So it's irrational. How many of you know that somehow we think that we have control when we worry? When you worry about your kids that are out late at night, do you think that that helps the kids? There's a lot better things you can do for your kids when they're out late at night than worrying, I'll tell you that much. The third reason why worry is irrational is that every time you start worrying about something, it gets bigger and bigger in your mind. Let me give you an example. Somebody criticizes you. They say an unkind word. Now, now here I'm going to kind of knock the, the social media a little bit. The Facebook thing. You know what? When you communicate through these technological ways, you, people misinterpret each other all the time. And they get offended at each other. And then when somebody give, you know, criticizes you, or maybe it's just an offhand comment that they make, and they've forgotten it already. They've forgotten it, you know, the second it comes out of their mouth. But you worry about that. And you spend the next week just fussing and fussing about what that person said. And pretty soon you think that the whole world hates you. So first of all, worry 
is unreasonable. Number two, worry is unnatural. Worry is unnatural. Did you know that nature does not worry? I want you to know that, that ants don't worry. Cows don't worry. Plants don't worry. Rocks don't worry. The only thing on this planet that God made that worries are people. Now, in, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gives a couple of lessons. He gives us a biology lesson, and he gives us a botany lesson. Plants and animals. Okay, take a look. Matthew 6, 26. Jesus says, look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns. They're not worried about, do I have enough to live on? He says, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than birds? If God takes care of birds, isn't he going to take care of you? And then he says, I think we have the next slide, Matthew 6, 28, 29. Why do you worry about your clothes? Look at the lilies of the field. They don't worry about theirs, yet King Solomon in all of his glory was not clothed as beautifully as one of these. Uh, I love flowers. I'm maybe an odd guy. Uh, I don't know. I actually know there are some. Uh, uh, Kurt Maxwell, he, I know he loves flowers. He, he, he loves planting flowers. I love, my wife, she kills plants. She's not very good at it, and, she, and, and that's not her passion. I'm the one that does all the planting in our home. But I want you to know that even if you look at wild flowers, folks, the intricacy and the design of a simple wild flower out in the field just absolutely blows your mind. They don't have to put on makeup. They don't have to worry about their appearance or being accepted. Now, what he's doing is, is he's giving us a couple of lessons from nature. He says, okay, let's look at some bird watching. Now, if anybody is in, on God's welfare plan, it's the birds, okay? Now, birds are beautiful, but really, what do birds do? They tweet and they poop, okay? Now, you, you, you and I do the same thing, but we're so much more valuable than a bird. You know, birds, you don't eat little birds. I don't eat the birds that come and feed in my bird feeder. They don't provide sustenance, but he says the birds are on, God says the birds are on his welfare system. God just made them to be beautiful, to look at, and to listen to. I love birds. I look at birds in our yard all the time. But you know what it says, and, and, and this is what it says here, and I love it. It says, your father who created the birds. How many of you know that, that God is not the father of the birds? God's not the father of the cows. He's not the father of, of the plants. He's your father because he created you in his image. You are special to him. And folks, this morning, your father, if he cares for the birds, how much more? Now, some of you here this morning say, ah, Pastor Steve, I'm a natural worrier. No, you're not. God did not create you to worry. You were not born a worrier. I don't know of any babies that worry. They cry a lot because they want something, but they don't worry. You learned, worrying is a learned behavior, and you can unlearn that behavior by the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Amen. Verse 26, like I said, it says, your father takes care of the birds. All right, let's move on. Number three, worry is unhelpful. What do we mean by that? It's useless. It doesn't work. Matthew 6, 27, if we've got it up there on the screen. Who of you by worrying can add one single hour to his life? Now, we have at least one nurse in the audience this morning. Health professionals will tell you if you worry, it works the other way. It takes hours off of your life. Now, I want you to know that God did not create you to worry. He did not create you to do something that is bad for your physical health. 
Worrying cannot make you better looking, Brother Dolu, although you're, you're already good looking already, so you don't need to worry. It won't make you any taller, and unfortunately, it won't make me any slimmer. All right? As a matter of fact, somebody said worrying is like sitting in a rocking chair and rocking. You expend ener energy, but it doesn't get you anywhere. All right? Did you know that the only thing that worrying can change is you? Worrying can make you miserable. Someone said, stewing without doing gets you nowhere. Some of you say, I'm a professional worrier, Pastor Steve. Yeah. And you know what? The Lord wants you to change. Proverbs 12, 25, if we look at it on the screen, it sort of says, worrying weighs us down. Can you give a testimony this morning? It weighs us down. We get discouraged. We get depressed because we were not designed to worry. Someone said, every time you swallow your worry, your stomach keeps score. I know people who struggle with anxiety disorders, and I'm telling you, it affects not only your psychology, it affects your physical body as well. I'm not making fun of anxiety this morning. And if you need treatment for anxiety, you need to go for treatment. But this morning, by the power of the Holy Spirit, He can help you overcome and live a life of peace. Amen? Amen. You can reject worry. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Proverbs 13, verse 40 says, A heart at peace gives life to the body. Isn't that an interesting verse? The fourth reason we should not worry is because worry is unnecessary. The fourth thing Jesus teaches on the, at the Sermon on the Mount is he says, There is no need to worry because your Father has already taken care of it. You know, when I was a kid, if I had some need in my life, I didn't worry about it. I just went to dad. Hey, dad, I need some money. My dad had to figure out where the money came from. Right? I never once worried about where my dad was going to get his money from. That was his worry. Folks, worrying is assuming responsibility that God never intended you to have. You can write that down. Worrying is assuming responsibility for something that God never intended you to have. Every time you are worrying, it is like a warning light. You know when you come to an intersection and that light turns orange? You, you're, you suddenly get alert because something's changing. When you worry, it's, it's a warning light that says that you are playing God and you're acting like God. You're thinking that everything depends on you, and it doesn't. Matthew 6, verse 30. If God cares so wonderfully, even for the flowers that are here today and gone tomorrow. I was in my mom's and dad's backyard yesterday. They've got a beautiful lilac tree. Last week, that bush was covered in lilacs. Guess what? The lilacs are gone. All that's left is brown stems where the lilacs were. Here today, gone tomorrow. It says, if God cares so wonderfully for the flowers that are here today, won't he surely, surely care for you? You see, what it is saying is that God has assumed responsibility for the needs in your life. I want you to know, Clarissa, that God has assumed responsibility not only for yours and Jonathan's needs, but he has assumed responsibility for your children's needs as well. He has assumed responsibility for Justin and for Steph. You don't need to worry about your children. Your heavenly Father has taken responsibility for your children. Amen. I don't know, maybe that's just a prophetic word directly to you right now. Whenever we start thinking that God's not going to take care of me, that God doesn't really love me, that he isn't a good God, how many of you know you know where those thoughts come from? 
Those thoughts do not come from your heavenly Father. And I want you to know that we battle those thoughts all the time. Kit, I can guarantee you, as sweet as a lady you are, this week God or Satan has come to you and said, you know what, Kit, God can't be a good God. Look at the mess you're in. The accuser of the brethren. It's a spiritual battle, this business, folks, of learning to trust God. You know, if Jesus died on the cross, he solved your biggest problem. He took your sin away, and he made you his child, and you are now a citizen of heaven. He, cre he, he, he took care of the biggest problem you have in your life. And if he can take care of that, can't you trust him to take care of how you're going to meet your par car, car payment this week? You know, if I was walking down the street, Pastor Ted, if I was walking down Gateway Boulevard, and I had my backpack on, and, and you came driving, and you, th and you said, I, th I thought that was Pastor Steve. And, and, and you pull up, and you pull over, and you say, Pastor Steve, do you need a ride? And, and I get into the car, but I leave my backpack on. And, and, and we're driving down the road, and Pastor Ted says, you know, Pastor Steve, you can take your backpack off. It's okay. You know, the car can handle the backpack. That, that's what we do in life. We say, Lord, you carry me. You take care of me, but you know what? I'm going to hang on to this backpack of worry. I'm going to carry this with me because, you know what? I just, I just think that, that I can handle that. That's not what God wants you to do. He wants you to get in the car, and then he wants you to take the backpack off. Amen? Praise the Lord. Number five, worry is unbelief. Worry is unbelief. Worry is doubting God. Now it's getting quiet in here. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. I love this in the message. You can be sure. That means certain, not a hope. You can be sure that God will take care of everything you need because what, of what Jesus has done for us. Like I said before, folks, God is good to you, not because you're good. God is good to everybody. Did you know that? God is good to the sinner. He extends his mercy and grace to everyone, even those who reject him. We had a beautiful rain last night. My neighbor cusses like a whatever. But you know what? The rain fell on his property too. They get food. They get oxygen to breathe just like you do. But you know what? God is good to you. Not because you deserve it, but because he's a good God. Amen. Matthew 6.32, people who don't know God and the way he works, they worry over these things. Wow. You see, folks, it's people who don't trust God who worry. Let me say something. If, if, if you have stepped across the line this morning, and, and if you're if you're, and, 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 or if you've never stepped across the line and committed your life to Christ. If you're not a believer, I want you to know that if Jesus is not the shepherd of your life, you have everything to worry about. You're depending on yourself to get through life. You have everything to worry about. You ought to worry. Wow. All right. But we need to get to the starting point where we realize that God is God and we are not. You see, it's actually an insult to God for you to worry. Did you know that you're acting like an orphan every time you worry? You're telling God, I like the, the, this idea maybe that, that you're my father up there in heaven somewhere, but, but you're acting like an orphan every time you worry because you simply cannot trust your daddy. You're acting like you don't have a father who has promised you over and over 3,000 promises in God's word. When, you're worry, when you worry, you're also acting like an atheist. You're acting like there, are no, there is no God. Like there, is no, there are no promises in God's word. John chapter 14, verse 1. Let's take a look at that. Jesus said, don't be worried. What do I do instead of worrying? Believe in God and believe in me. Now, we're going to move really quickly, and I'm going to conclude the sermon, because 
it's not good enough just to tell you that you shouldn't worry. What do you need to do instead? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Point number one, every day ask him to be your shepherd. This sounds very simple, but sometimes we're sheep and we need some simple lessons this morning. Every morning when you get up, you ask him to be your shepherd. You say, Lord, I need you to feed me today. I need you to lead me today. I need you to meet my need today. You are my shepherd. I'm expecting you. I'm looking to you this morning. You are a good God. And then say it throughout the day, every time you go into a meeting, every time you go to a parent-teacher conference and you're terrified about what they're going to say about your children's progress, Lord, you are going to be my shepherd right now. I will not worry. Lord, you are there and I trust you. John chapter 10, verse 14 and 15, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and they know me. And I lay down my life for the sheep. Wow. Who is that? That's Jesus who says that, right? I mean, my wife loves me. And I'm not sure, dear. Would you ever lay down your life for me? Would you? Wow. You have to think about that. Yeah, I know. You know what? Your father is willing to lay down his... He did lay down his life for you. No, he's not willing. He did. You know, we need to say the verse like, uh, like the psalmist said. Psalm 28, verse 9. You can learn, memorize. Very short one. Come, Lord. Save us and bless us. Be our shepherd and always carry us in your arms. Amen. You know that wonderful poem, right? The footprints in the sand... I'm not going to bother for the sake of time this morning. He wants to carry you in his arms. How many of you remember when you were a little kid and you would go out uh, fishing with dad? Uh, I did that many times. And we'd go on these long walks to fish. And my legs were exhausted. And i just say, Dad, on our way home, I need you to carry me. You know, carry me, Dad. How many of you heard that from your kids? I, I can't do it. And, and Jesus said, you know, it's okay. I will be there. I will carry you. I will defend you. I will protect you. Amen. Just hop in my car and take off your backpack. Number two, quickly. Number two. I give Jesus first place in every area of my life. We're going to move really quickly through this right now. This is so important, and you need to listen to me today. If you're a believer, you've given him first place in your life. You've said, Lord, I want you to be number one. Amen? But you know what? There are times where we keep some parts of the house to ourselves. And we need to get to the place this morning where we say, Lord, you can have every part. You can have the kitchen. You can have the living room. You can have the bedroom. You can have every closet that I have in my house, every drawer that I keep my secret things in, Lord, it's all yours today. Give him first place in your life. You know what I'm talking about this morning. Even you young people here, you haven't collected a lot of junk yet, but you know what? In your heart, you've got different rooms. You've got different parts. And some parts, it's easy to give to the Lord, right? But there's other parts that we need to give to him. We need to give him access. You don't say, yeah, God, I just want you to get me to heaven and that's good enough. I want you to be number one in every area of my life. Matthew 6, 31 to 33, I think we have it. Your heavenly Father already knows perfectly well what you need. He knows it, folks. God doesn't say, oops, I never saw that one coming. I, I, I'm sorry, boy, I really missed that need in your life. You know what, I think it would be great to pre preach a sermon, Pastor Ted, on, on all of the things that you will never hear God say. You'll never hear God say, oops. Can you imagine your surgeon? That's, you don't want to hear your surgeon saying that when you're on the operating table. 
God will never say that. You know what? You have needs that you don't even know you have. And God knows what they are. And God says, you know what? He, he, he doesn't even see the need he has, but I'm going to meet it for him anyway. Amen. Give him first place in your life. When you worry, it's a sign that you haven't given that to the Lord yet. When you make Jesus Christ number one in every single area of your life, it simplifies your priorities. How many of you know this morning that I don't have to worry about how many barnacles I have on my yacht? I don't have a yacht. You're absolutely right. I don't have to worry about the things that people, you know, the more stuff you have, the more there is to worry about. You live a simple lifestyle and you trust the Lord. Amen? I don't have a purse. Now, ladies, I'm going to step on toes this morning. I don't have a purse that cost $500. Hmm. Wow. Brother Dolu, I don't have a suit that costs a thousand bucks. <laughs> Better stop meddling here this morning. When you make God the number one priority of your life, I want you to know that he's going to say, man, you're my son, you're my daughter, I love you, and I'm going to care for you. As long as you love something else in your life more than God, in that area, it's going to become a source of worry to you. You know what? If you haven't given your money to God, if you have not committed your finances to God, you are going to worry about your money. If you haven't committed your children, your job, your, your career, your marriage, if you have not committed your marriage to God, you're going to worry about that in your life. Number three, and we're going to talk about this in, 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 in the next message that I'm going to preach in this series. All right, you need to relax and you need to give God your worries in prayer. Pray. Prayer. That's what prayer is. God wants you to come to him. I had someone this week say, Pastor Steve, you know, I, I really don't want to bother you too much. And that's why I haven't uh, sent you an email or contacted you. And I said, for goodness sake, that's what I'm here for. If, if I can say that as a pastor, how much more would you, your heavenly father say, you know what? You need to contact me. You need to talk to me. I'm not too busy to hear from you. Relax and give your worries to the Lord in prayer. Remember last week I said, count your, or two weeks ago, the first uh, message in the series, I said, count your blessings. I said, write them all down. As a matter of fact, in our life group on that Tuesday night, we took turns going over our list of the things that God has blessed us with. You know what some of you need to do? You need to make a list of the worries that you have. You need to sit down and you need to not just generalize, oh, I'm generally worried about my life or whatever. Pray and ask God to reveal to you what it is. What are the root causes of your, what is really bothering you? Is it the disapproval of people? Is it your success in your business? Is it your security about your retirement? Is it about the fact that Maybe courage, maybe you're worrying about the fact that you're going to be single for the rest of your life. Am I ever going to find a good woman? Are there any good women out there? Courage, you don't need to worry about that, my friend. He will take care of that for you. Is my marriage going to survive? I want you to know that we need to pray for the families in our church, people. People, our, the families in our church go through struggles and battles, and we need to pray for them. We need to stand together with them and not allow the enemy to tear our families apart. Is that what you, is, is the source of your worry today? First, first Peter chapter 5, verse 7, get, give all your worries and cares to God. In other words, don't stuff them. Release them to him, for he cares about what happens to you. 
Another translation, actually, I think it's the Old King James. It says, cast, right? Cast your care on the Lord. Now, some of you, you cast your care like a fisherman does. I love fishing, by the way. What does a fisherman do? When he casts that lure into the water, he just brings it right back in again, right? That's not the kind of casting you need to do today. When you cast your care on the Lord, you need to leave it there. Amen? You need to let him carry it this morning. Matthew 6.32 again. Let's take a look at this. For the people who don't know God, they run after these things. Hey, eh? They run after these things. Is that what you're running after? And you go, wow, you know, the Holy Spirit is sure speaking to me this morning. I'm, I'm not much better than the people in the world. I'm just running Running to and fro after these things. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of Black Friday after Thanksgiving in the United States. Everyone's going to the mall. Boy, and you're going to push everybody out of the way so you can get the best deal. That's the way the world lives. Unbelievers who don't know God, this is the way that they act out. Frantic, grabbing everything they can for themselves hurrying and scurrying around. You can write this phrase down, hurry creates worry. Philippians 4, 6, and 7, here it is again. And if you haven't memorized this, I, can, I probably quote this verse more times than any other verse. Don't worry about anything. Be anxious for nothing, right? But in everything, with thanksgiving and prayer and supplication, right? Let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God that transcends, that passes, that supersedes all understanding will guard your heart and your mind. Folks, it's either the peace of God or the worry of, of the enemy. He wants to give you peace that transcends understanding. Peace. How many of you know of people that go, you know what, it doesn't matter how stressful life is, they always seem to have it under control. And you go, man, I wish I could live like that. God wants you to live like that today. He wants to give you peace that, that human understanding doesn't even reason with. It could be the night before your exam, people. And man, I wish I would have heard this sermon some time ago when I was a kid. I used to worry myself sick for my exams. When I'd sit down to write an exam, the panic would come over me and I couldn't even think straight to write my exams. The peace that passes all understanding. Okay, so point number, number one, every day I start by saying, Lord, you're my shepherd. Number two, I give him first place in my life. Number three, I relax and I Bring everything to the Lord in prayer. And number four, here it is. I trust him for one day at a time. One day at a time. Now you all know, I know right away all of you old folks are, think, are singing that song, right? There it is, Pastor Ted is singing it. Who sang that? Was it Dolly Parton? One day at a time, Lord, that's all I'm asking from you. Chris Christopherson? Oh, yeah. Well, they had a good point. Matthew 6, 34. This is what Jesus says. Don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow has its own worries. Each day has enough trouble of its own. We all agree with that verse, but we don't live by it. You don't need to borrow trouble from tomorrow, folks. You don't need to open up your umbrella before it rains. You got it? You deal with today. You live today. You know what happens when you forget to do that? You miss all of God's blessings today. You spend so much time worrying about tomorrow, you miss the incredible blessings that God has for you right now, today. Some of you are so worried about your roast that's burning in the oven at home right now that you can't even enjoy my message. Um, whatever. There's an old corny joke. 
You see, when you think about it, today is the tomorrow that you worried about yesterday, right? Yesterday, you messed up yesterday because you were worrying about today. And today, you're messing up today because you're worrying about tomorrow, and it goes on and on. And there's a couple of reasons, folks, that we should only live one day at a time. First of all, like I said, when you worry about tomorrow's problems, you miss today's blessings. We've already talked about that. The second reason is that you cannot solve tomorrow's problems with today's power. God did not give you the ability to carry tomorrow's problems. He wants, you, he wants to carry you today for this time. Some of you have something coming up in two weeks and you're so scared to death, you're going to ruin every day between now and that event two weeks from now. It's unhelpful, it's useless to do. And the Lord, your shepherd, says, I don't want you doing that. Don't worry about tomorrow. You cannot solve tomorrow's problems with today's power. How many of you know that when Jesus taught us the Lord's Prayer, he did not say, give us today our weekly bread. Right? He said, give us today our daily bread. Amen? Just give me strength, Lord, for this day. I'm trusting you for this day, and I'm trusting you for tomorrow. Now, planning is good. I didn't say don't plan for the future, folks. Only a fool wouldn't plan. But you know what? The Bible says that we make our plans, but it's the Lord who directs our path. Amen? Amen. Ultimately, that's where it comes from. Matthew chapter 6, 34, and now I'm bringing this message to an end. I don't even know how long I preached this morning because I wasn't worrying. <laughs> Amen. Matthew 6, 34, here we go. Give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. Don't get worked up. This is what the message says, I love it. Don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. Now, having said all of this, is it possible that worry may be one of your chronic sins this morning? It's helpful, or it's unhelpful, it's unreasonable, it's unbiblical, and it doesn't work. It's irrational, and it is unbelief this morning. Maybe it's time to say, God, I'm sorry. I, I haven't been saying, Lord, you are my good shepherd. I've been listening to the voices of the enemy. And today I need to learn to trust you to meet my needs. Can you stand with me this morning? Music team, let's conclude our service today.